Hi loves, this is Shannon Easterly, Licensed Clinical Marriage and Family Therapist. Um, today's video is going to be a piggyback on last week's video on Bowen Theory and Differentiation of Self. I'm going to do either two or three videos of theory and pattern that kind of overlap that idea of differentiation of self. Um, just things that I see over and over again in my practice. So today we are going to talk about the pattern of pursue withdraw, which is a very, very common relational pattern. You might also hear it as uh, pursuer distancer, demand withdraw, protest withdraw, any combination of those words. It is a pattern in which one partner um, and, it, and it can start in either place and it usually starts in really small ways and it just grows over time and then um, partners can get locked into position in it. But it's a, a, a pattern where one partner tends to pursue the other partner. The other partner feels their anxiety come up in that pursual. Um, and we'll talk in a minute about what pursual looks like. As that partner's anxiety comes up, they begin to withdraw, which then creates anxiety for the pursuing partner. So the pursuing partner pursues even more, which creates anxiety for the withdrawing partner. So the withdrawing partner withdraws, which creates anxiety for the pursuing partner. And it just keeps going like that. Um, I have a friend and colleague who actually talks about that as an infinity loop. I'm not as fancy, so I just talk about it as a circle. Um, but you can see how each one of those interactions kind of feeds the other interaction. So what do those positions look like? Pursuit can look like angry pursuit. Um, it can look like protestation, um, demands for time, attention. Um, it can look like frustration. It can look like tears. It can look like sadness. It can look like anxiety. It, whatever it is, it is a, a means of communicating to the other partner, I need more of you. For the partner who is in the pursuer position, the, the desire is to not feel abandonment. They are looking for, both partners are looking for safety. That is the most important thing to remember is that both partners are looking for safety. They're just looking for it in different ways. The partner who is in the role of the pursuer is looking to feel safe by not feeling abandoned. The partner who is withdrawing, they are looking to feel safe by backing up and not feeling overwhelmed by the emotion of the pursuer or by overwhelmed by their own emotions because of what's happening in the relationship. So again, they're trying to feel safe as well. Oftentimes they're withdrawing as an effort to um, to prevent feeling like they're failing in some way or could fail. If they feel like they can't meet the needs of the pursuer, then they are gonna back up to make sure that they don't put themselves in a position where they're gonna disappoint someone and have to deal with those feelings. So what happens in relationships um, oftentimes is, I, one of the ways that I describe it is that it's almost like the pursuer creates a, a, um, a wind current that as the pursuer is pursuing, it pushes that withdrawer away. And then as the withdrawer goes farther away, the pursuer tries again and it pushes that withdrawer farther away. This cycle can be affected by either person. Um, my kid, I loved when she was little and I would play Foxy Loxy and I would like make voices with my little foxes. So I do that in session because I'm a big goofball. Um, so if <laughs> the pursuer <laughs> is pursuing and let's say that that is the female partner that is not always the case um, it is especially not always the case if it's um, two men in the relationship <laughs> but if that if the let's say the female partner that's pursuing as as she pursues the male is like I'm out <laughs> pursuer pursues some more males like I'm out if the pursuer can take a step back oftentimes the withdrawing partner will be like uh, hold it. <laughs> Where'd you go? Hey, you're not behind me like you normally are. <laughs> and then that partner will start to like move back toward the relationship. The same thing can happen if, if the pursuer is constantly pursuing and the withdrawer is 
constantly withdrawing and the withdrawer turns around and faces the pursuer, oftentimes the pursuer will back up. Whoa, hey, what was that? And then that creates space to come together. So the dance that a couple does usually doesn't change over the life of their relationship. The pursuer pretty much stays in the pursuing role. The withdrawer stays in the withdrawing role. I'll tell you about an exception to that in just a minute. Um, what we're looking for is a softening of that dance so that we don't get frozen into those roles and that they're not, um, they're not destructive in the relationship. So there, there is a time when those roles can reverse. Oftentimes if one partner has been pursuing and pursuing and pursuing and the person withdrawing has been withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing, eventually that pursuer is gonna get really tired and they're gonna stop pursuing. And when that pursuer stops pursuing and just turns away, oftentimes then you will see that cycle reverse and the withdrawer will begin pursuing and then sometimes that cycle just completely turns around. Um, sometimes if, if the couple is, is skilled enough, they can meet in that space. So how does this relate to Bowen theory and differentiation of self? The more differentiated we are, the more able we are to observe ourselves in relationship with others. So if as an individual, I am in the role of pursuer, um, I probably lean toward enmeshment. Those two things go together, pursuing and enmeshment. Um, somebody who wants to get things resolved and wants to be connected and wants to be close is probably gonna be the one who pursues that closeness in the relationship. If I'm able to, re to observe that in myself, the more differentiated I become, the more I can tolerate distance and the more I can tolerate not having to have everything resolved right now. So the more I can observe when I am pursuing a partner and I can self-soothe and calm myself down and create space for that partner to come back toward me. If I am a distancer in relationship, then I am probably the partner who leans toward cutoff. And the more differentiated I am, the more I can observe my propensity to move toward cutoff and I can ask myself some questions. You know, what is it that's making me move away in this moment? And can I stay present and can I turn toward, or can I even narrate what I'm experiencing in a way that I can stay connected to my partner in this? The more we can do that work, um, the the more connected the relationship. So again, we're looking to lower reactivity. We're looking to soften that dance and that pattern. Um, this would be a good place for me to know how to edit tape because I could like edit it out this pause, but there's a good chance that this pause will be right smack in the middle of it. I remember what I was gonna say. Remember that reactivity doesn't have to be loud. Reactivity can be quiet. So it can be the reactivity of, I am protesting. I, I want you right here, right now. We've got to figure this out. It can be the reactivity of, I am walking out of the room and I, oh, <laughs> and I can't tolerate talking about this anymore. We have to be done for now. Um, or I can't tolerate talking about it again. So reactivity doesn't necessarily have to be loud and crazy. It can be just a shutdown. And again, the more we move toward differentiation, the more we can observe ourselves and say, okay, what is it about that specific topic, money, sex, kids, that makes me shut down so fast? Or what is it about that specific thing that makes me react so high or feel so scared and need such closeness to my partner? So that's how the, the pursuer distance or pattern kind of overlaps that idea of enmeshment, reactivity cut off with, again, the antithesis being differentiation of self. And the more sense of self that we have and the more differentiated we are, the more we are able in relationship to observe that relational dance and be able to soften the steps so that 
every close relationship has conflict. Every close relationship has conflict. If there's no conflict, it's not a close relationship. And so it is really, and, and research supports this, it's not the conflict that makes or breaks a relationship, it's how are we able to repair? I like to think about it um, like the, the mechanism in strength training. You know, the muscle has to tear before it can come back stronger. And it's only by tearing that it grows. That's, that's the only way that it grows. And relationships are like that too. The conflict is when it tears, it's the repair is when it grows. If we are not working toward our own differentiation of self, when it tears, it just stays torn. When we're working on how we show up in relationship and our, our level of reactivity and managing our way through that, that's what then allows us to stay present and yet not overwhelming so that we can create repair. And that place in the fabric of our relationship can actually get reinforced and be stronger than it was before the tear. That is it for today. Do I have anything exciting to share? Um, I'm gonna tell my favorite joke. Um, Duck walks into a grocery store. Walks up to the grocer, says, hey man, got any grapes? Grocer says, no, got no grapes. Duck says, okay, walks off. Next day, Duck walks into the grocery store, says, hey man, got any grapes? Grocer says, no, I got no grapes. Duck says, okay, walks off. Next day, Duck walks into the grocery store, says to the grocer, hey man, got any grapes? Grocer says, no man, I got no grapes. And if you ask me again, I'm gonna nail your stinking web foot to the floor. Duck says, okay, walks off. Next day, Duck walks into the grocery store, says, hey man, got any nails? Grocer says, no, I got no nails. Duck says, good, got any grapes? <laughs> that is thanks to my good friend, TDC. That's an inside joke. <laughs> Have a great day, love you, mwah. <coughs> Hairball. <laughs>